In this video, we're going to start looking at how web pages are actually structured. You should think of the web as being a sea of documents that all link together and bear a strong similarity to the printed documents that you run into in everyday life. For example, a newspaper. A newspaper has uh, headers for the story, different size of headers depending on the story that you're looking at. It has paragraphs then of the story itself. Different pages may have different columns, different number of columns. So the copy may fit on there differently. Uh, some of the stories may have pictures that go along with it. So th the way that the newspaper is actually laid out for you to read is the structure of that newspaper. The same could be said of schedules, whether it's a sports schedule of some sort, a racing form at the, at the thoroughbred track, or a train schedule of sorts, bus schedule. They all are laid out in a certain way with columns, pretty much with schedules, it's a kind of a table layout, but yet they are laid out somehow in some structure that is meaningful to the person that's actually reading it. Forms. I'm sure you've filled out plenty of forms, especially if you ever go to a doctor's office or a hospital. There's plenty of forms out there, and they are structured in a certain way. So we want to be able to structure our web documents similarly to the way that all these things are structured as well. So what we're going to start learning is that we will have to actually tell the web browser how the information that we want to display should be structured. We will tell the web browser if this should be a header. And if it's a header, what size a header? How big should it be? Should this be a paragraph? Should this be a ordered list with a bullet in front of it? Things like that. Should it be a table? Do we need to align this in a table format? So we need to tell those things to the browser. There's actually been five versions of HTML since the web began. The development of the language is overseen by an organization called the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C. And I behoove you to go out to the W3C's website, which is www.w3c.org, and you'll find a lot of help to the things that we're doing in this class on that website as well as many other websites. The latest is HTML5 and we're going to focus primarily on that particular version in this course. The two other versions that you may run into once you get out and start working in, in the field is HTML 4.01 which was the last major version of the language from December 1999 and a stricter version from 2000 called Extensible Hypertext Markup Language or XHTML. You will still find XHTML used in a number of applications. A lot of the stuff in ASP.NET is actually done in XHTML, although with Visual Studio 12 they're starting to go to the HTML5 as well. But there's a lot of stuff out there. So it's important that the differences, especially between XHTML and HTML5, are made known to you. And as we run into those situations where you need to be aware of the differences, we will point them out as we go through this course. You need to understand that HTML is a markup language. Okay, So that to you may not mean a darn thing, or it may make you think of a lot of things and all of a sudden you're getting kind of complicated renditions of what you think this might be all of a sudden. But you really come across it every day. When you create documents in a word processor, you add styles to the text to explain a document structure, you add headings, change headings, sizes, you might enter a table in there, you start paragraphs, um, you start a new paragraph every time you hit return um, on your keyboard. So you're using markup language while you don't have to implicitly decide what markup that's going to be. The word processor does that for you. 
you are actually using markup language to create that document in Word or whatever it happens to be you're using. When we do it on the web, however, you have to actually add those tags. It's not done automatically for you. That isn't a wholly true statement, though, because as you start to develop ASP.NET and start using Visual Studio um, to do your web development, there is functionality within Visual Studio to drag and drop controls onto a web page. And in that case, it will add the elements or the tags, the markup that it needs for you. But you can still go in and modify them. In this class, we're going to do it strictly by hand to make sure that we learn everything from the bottom up and don't start working with shortcuts and easy outs, if it, if it were, so that when you run into a problem, you actually understand the markup language and can fix it when it needs to be. So after we add all that markup structure to the document, the browsers like Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari, Google, Opera, all use that markup then to help decide how to present the text in a familiar fashion to the user. So in essence, you, we actually end up sending the HTML as we write it from the server to the browser. It's the browser that actually parses the HTML and then displays it in a GUI interface that the user can understand. You don't need any special programs to write web pages. You can use a text editor such as Notepad on Windows or a text edit on Mac or what I would prefer that you use in here is Notepad++ and there that's covered in Module 3 and there's a video explaining the nuances to that and why that's a good program to use outside of Visual Studio. After you create your page, you would give it an extension of 8.html or .htm. HTM is shorter, it's one less keystroke you have to type, but in all honesty, I prefer to see you use .html because it's truly the extension that should be used. I will not take your points off if you use HTM, but you should get in the habit of using HTML. So let's take a look at an example here. And this is just example one from chapter one. And you'll see a lot of different markup here. It may look a little bit confusing at first when you first look at it, but there are several sets of angle brackets with words, such as the body here, the P here, the H1. We have a head tag here, HTML tag title tag. This is the actual markup that you need to put in there. So these are all referred to as tags. So a tag ex exists as the less than symbol, the text that's inside of it, and the greater than symbol. There are specific tags that are recognized by each version of HTML. And HTML5 has a lot of new tags that will point out as we go along that didn't exist before it came along, before HTML5 actually came along. Again, as I said, the two brackets and all the characters between them are tags. They come in pairs. There are opening tags and there are closing tags. The closing tag always has a forward slash after the first angle bracket. So you can see here, this is the opening tag without that slash and here's the closing tag of the HTML with the slash. The pair of tags and all the content between them is called an element. So again, in this graphic down here, here's the opening tag, the closing tag. This is the content that will be displayed as a header. H1 is a header tag we'll talk about later. But the whole thing as a whole, when you put this all together, this is referred to as an element. So you can see there's several tags throughout here, and each of them have closing tags. All opening tags should have a closing tag. There's our opening HTML, 
Here's our closing HTML. Here's our opening head. Here is our closing head. Now the text that's between the H1 opening and closing tag and the H is a header and this is the highest level. It's the most important one. It's the highest. We'll talk about it again later. But it will actually display about Google. Then we have a series of paragraphs. Each one of these paragraphs will display on or display separately. This will not be an indented paragraph like you might be used to with Word, but it'll be a block paragraph separated by an empty line. We'll talk more about that later as well, but the H1 and paragraph tags are all block level elements which add a line of space above and below them to separate them from the rest of the content. One of the things that you'll hear used quite often in this class and anytime you're dealing with HTML is relationships between the tags. And we kind of use the family relationship as a way of describing things. For example, we have a body and the body has children underneath of it. The H1 is a child and each of the paragraph tags is a child. So in this case the body is the parent, the H1 and P's are all children of the body. We could take it one step further and say that the HTML is the parent, the body then would be the child of the HTML, the H1 and P's would be children of the body or descendants of the HTML. And conversely then, while the body is the parent of an H1 or a P tag in this example, the HTML would be an ancestor of the body as well as H1 and P, but specifically it would be the parent of the body as an ancestor. So get used to those terms because you're going to see them quite often. When a web page is written in HTML, the whole page or document is contained between the opening and closing HTML tags, as you just saw. Inside the HTML element, there are two sections. There's the head section, which contains information about the document for the browser. It contains no content that's going to be displayed in the page, only information for the browser. That information could be in the form of what the title of the page is, any style sheets that might, might belong to the page that's going to not structure the page, but actually decide how the page will look as far as color and, and things like that. And it could also include some JavaScript that the browser would use to run um, as needed on the page. So it is nothing that's going to display. It is only things that the browser needs in order to display the page properly. Then you have the body element, and this is where the content is stored. This is the information the user will actually see in a browser window. Now I mentioned the title before. The title element is actually a child of the head element. It contains what will display in the tab and what will be the default value of the bookmark page. So if we go back to the code page we were just looking at and actually run this, we're going to view this in Firefox, this is what that page actually looks like. Notice the title on the tab, Popular Websites colon Google. Also, look what happens when I want to bookmark this page. I get the same title as the name for the bookmark. So you want this title to be not only meaningful, but you want to try to keep it short enough that the user doesn't have to retype what they're going to save it as and they immediately recognize it as what it is. Now of other note here, this is that header tag that we talked about. And these are the three paragraphs, and you can see the space that's been added between each of them. Now going back to our code again, 
here's that popular websites colon Google as the title which is a child of the head tag and again this is information that the browser is going to use and you just saw how that get, got used now a couple things to note back in the course content tab there is a course coding standards this contains a document that has all the coding standards that we're going to use for the web pages which will be through week 10 and the standards that will follow for JavaScript beginning in week 11. Now you can read these documents on your own. We're going to, I am going to point these things out as we go through. And going back to our code, there's a couple things that I want to point out. First of all, notice the indentation. You should always indent so that the opening and closing tag align with each other. That way it's easy to see that relationship. All of this is then a child of the body. It has to be because it's indented. Conversely then, because they're all at the same level, the H1 and the three paragraph tags here are all siblings because they're at the same level. They're all, they are all children of the same element. Now the one thing that, that in this example I don't like and what I prefer you do, first of all, this is short and sweet and there's no reason to do what I'm about to show you because it fits on one line. It's easy to see the opening and closing tag and very rarely will you have any other tags inside of that. These paragraph tags though could have some other data inside of them. So what I would prefer to see you do on long paragraphs is to actually line the tags up like this. So that rather than seeing it like this, you can see the opening and closing tag, they're lined up. Everything inside of that then is part of the content for that particular tag, in this case the paragraph tag. Now with that said, one of the things that you must do is nest these correctly. So for example, there's a EM element that puts emphasis on something and basically it just makes it italic. So if we save this, we'll go back to the web page as it was, now I just set this to italic with the EM. If I refresh this page you'll actually see it happen. Now it's italicized from the EM. That EM element is a child of the paragraph tag. So it's entire the entire element, the opening tag, the content, and the closing tag must be totally inside of the paragraph tag. Now this is referred to an inline tag as opposed to a block and again we'll talk about that later on but you would not want to do something like this. You would not want to take this EM and close it in this fashion. So you open a P, you open an EM, close a P and close EM. That's not contained within its parent. It's partially contained, but it's not completely contained. By leaving this where it was, it is now completely contained within its parent. The rule of thumb is for nested tags, you close them in the reverse order that you open them. So we open the body, we open the paragraph, we open the EM, we close the EM, we close the paragraph, and then we close the body. So it's done in a reverse order. And that's important to remember. That's nesting them correctly. And I will be a real stickler on those type of things. So make sure that you review those coding standards. And as we go through, we will talk about them to make sure that you're on board with them all.